Through hiking, any of the long trails of the world is an amazing experience, and it puts the human body to a mind-boggling test. My name is Happy Hour, and I'm an exercise and nutritional physiologist. In this series of videos, I'm going to tell you about the effects of what I like to call a bioenergetic storm on my body and its physiology. Uh, so the story I want to tell you is about my experience on the Pacific Crest Trail in 2021. I, I posted a video of that a couple years ago showing you my human experience, the emotional experience, the wilderness experience. But I want to tell you now another side of that story, which is the physiology. What happened from a physiology perspective to my body during that hike? It happened to be when I hiked the PCT, I was near the end of my academic career as a physiologist. In a university setting, I did research on physiology and I taught students, sports dietitians in particular, the physiology of nutrition and the physiology of exercise. And it happened to be that I had at my disposal uh, the capacity to do a lot of scientific measures that most people don't have access to. So before going out on the PCT, I went into the lab um, and, you know, just sort of measured myself or had my graduate students help me with collecting some data on myself. Then I went off, hiked the PCT, two and a half thousand miles, and four months later came back to St. Louis, went into the lab, and repeated those measures. I thought it would be just interesting, hands down, just, you know, I had a, an idea what to expect. But what I found was really striking and it confused me. It didn't add up. Um, but as an old friend of mine says, you know, sometimes you put your feet up and you think about it for a while and then things start to come to light. And I think I have an explanation for the bizarre findings. And it makes a really neat story that I'm here to share with you. Before going any further, I want to mention that this information is published as a case report in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Here we go. Um, I'd like to, to really to hopefully hook you start with the end of the story instead of start at the beginning. So the key findings are what I'm considering the end. And once, once we're done with the end, then we'll go back to the beginning and sort of, you know, tell you a little bit more about everything along the way and how I ended up or how my body ended up at that end. The end, here we are. Uh, what happened? Well, easy, I lost weight. Um, I was at a fairly high body weight when I started the hike, 191 pounds, and I lost 9% of that weight, which took me down to, to 174 pounds or 17 pound weight loss. We know that our bodies have fat and they have non-fat tissue. Sometimes we call that lean tissue. It turns out that absolutely every bit of the weight I lost was fat. As a matter of fact, half of my body fat went away. I started with 44 pounds of body fat and I ended up with 24 pounds of body fat at the end. Nearly 50% reduction in body fat levels. Uh, what about the fat-free mass? Well, typically when people lose weight, they lose some combination of both. You know, typical weight loss programs, about three-fourths of the weight loss is fat mass, about a quarter of it is lean mass. Well, in my case, probably because of all the exercise, I preserved all of my lean mass and even increased actually, which was pretty remarkable because I wasn't strength training, which would be more of a thing to, to cause an increase in lean mass, but I had about a 10 pound increase in lean mass. So you're thinking, big deal. Is any of this surprising? No, this is exactly what we would expect when somebody goes out and walks like crazy. I'll also mention maybe the other uninteresting parts is that my blood pressure didn't change at all as a result of hiking two and a half thousand miles. Um, and my uh, blood sugar levels, whether fasting blood sugar or hemoglobin A1C, they didn't change at all either. But these aren't surprising given that my blood pressure and, and sugar levels were, were perfectly normal in the very low end of the normal range and we wouldn't want to see them go any lower. Again, not surprising. Had they been high, then probably would have expected some improvement, some improvement but they weren't. Um, now getting a little more into the interesting bits. When we walk, we call that weight-bearing exercise. When we put a backpack on, it even loads the skeleton more. That creates a stress in the skeleton and the stress adapts and becomes stronger as a result of walking. Typically, that's what happened. Well, as a consequence of walking two and a half thousand miles, you'd think my bone density would have gone up, but it went down, it went way down. Two sites that are commonly measured 
are the spine, the, the vertebrae in particular in the lower back, and the hip. And the reason we measure those from a clinical perspective is because these are where people's bones break when they get old and their bones get um, thin, so to speak, but it means low bone density. So instead of an increase, I had a decrease. As a matter of fact, my spine bone mineral density decreased by 9%. And if you're shopping for a sweater and you see a sale on, on that sweater, it says 10% off, you're thinking, big deal, that's hardly anything. 9% is even less. Well, in the bone world, a 9% decrease is enormous. That's roughly equivalent to what we see when people age for 30 years. So we take a 30-year-old and watch their bone mineral density till they become 60, and you would expect about a 9% drop over that time. Uh, another time you might see that is in space flight. When astronauts go into space, you may have heard they lose bone like crazy. The stress on the skeleton goes away in, in a lack of gravity sort of environment. And in a few weeks, they can lose 9% bone mineral density or bone mass. So to see this in, in, in somebody who's walking, something that should increase it, but actually decrease it, is enormous. I'll also mention my hip bone mineral density. It went down a lot less, but it did go down one or one and a half percent, depending on which measure you look at. So much smaller in the hip, but still very, very important. So this is not good. And not only is it not good, it's bizarre. It's contrary to expectations. And when we go back to the beginning of the story and start coming through forward, I think I have an explanation for this. Body fat levels, um, uh, bone measures, etc. Those were all measured with a, a very expensive device called a DEXA scanner dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. It's as good a method as you can use to, to measure those things. Another thing that was measured was blood variables, in particular lipids. I mentioned the, uh, uh, the blood sugar levels, hemoglobin A1c and fasting blood sugar. Um, I'm also going to show you lipids, cholesterol, and triglycerides. All of these were measured in a certified clinical laboratory, the kind of a lab that does things for medical uh, purposes for hospitals, for clinics, etc. So again, high quality measures, fasting blood, taken out of the arm, sent off to the clinic. Start off with cholesterol, uh, total cholesterol. Exercise often makes it go down. Weight loss very reliably makes cholesterol go down. In my case, cholesterol went up. It went up 24%, 37 point increase in total cholesterol. You might say, well, what part of the cholesterol? We know we have good cholesterol, we have bad cholesterol. Well, it turns out bad cholesterol is to explain for this. Bad cholesterol went up as well. It went up 39%, a 28-point increase in LDL cholesterol. Also measured the so-called good cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and it did go up, but it only went up three points. And it's very worthwhile. It's a healthful change. Um, but it didn't really explain the, the increase in total cholesterol. So really the, the front line here is a total cholesterol increase, largely explained by increases in the bad part of the cholesterol of that total. Also measured triglycerides, uh, not as commonly measured as it used to be, but it's still something that's very, cl very clinically relevant. Triglycerides normally go down when a person loses weight or when they start an exercise program, but in my case, triglycerides went up. As a matter of fact, a 57% increase in triglyceride levels. This is not modest. This is large. That's a 46-point increase in triglycerides. Um, so, like I said for bone, this is not good, and it's bizarre. It's contrary to what we would expect, and it's something we would consider undesirable from a health perspective. At first, it's like, how could this be? What is the explanation? Thought about it for quite some time, days, weeks, maybe even months before I finally came up with an idea, an, ex an explanation that would put all these pieces together and be a cohesive story. So I'm going to give that to you. 